y'all ever had one of those weeks where there just wasn't enough time to do everything? That was this week for me. Um, and some pastors, by no means all, don't hear me throw in shade where it's not deserved, some pastors deal with that reality sometimes by falsely claiming that at the last minute, the Spirit changed their sermon. I don't want to lie. I, I very literally don't want to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. He didn't change my sermon at the last minute. I just ran out of time this week. And, and I, I hope we can love each other enough for me to be transparent toward that. But here's the thing. I am motivated, I am dedicated this morning to not skipping this passage. Two reasons why. One, I don't want to punt on this passage because I have been a part of two different congregations who have preached through 1 Timothy, and in both churches, they punted on chapter 5. So in in church 1, the pastor read what we just read, And then he called up a deacon to share a testimony that took like 30, 35 minutes to share. And then he prayed and the service was over. Like there was no sermon on that passage. The testimony had nothing to do with it. And I was kind of a new Christian, so I thought, well, maybe he'll pick up next week. I don't know how preachers work. And the next week, you know what we did? We went to chapter 6. We we never covered that. So it's a fresh wound, man. Secondly... In the second church, the pastor simply stopped preaching at the end of chapter 4. We never covered chapter 5 or chapter 6, as if they weren't particularly important. And I hope over, over the last several months you've seen what Timothy has to say is very important for our life as a church. And I hope you see in the next month-ish that we still have in First Timothy that chapter 5 and 6 matter, <laughs> like they're, they're important. Uh, The bottom line is that even with my limitations this week, I am dead set on preaching this passage. I'm motivated for one Savior to hear this part of God's Word, but I'm not just motivated. If I could use the the Bible's Word, I I feel a particular burden for our church to hear this passage. Because this church deals with an issue that every healthy church has to deal with. To use Paul's language from earlier in the letter, y'all remember we want to be a church that is sound, or another way to translate it, that is healthy. Not just in our teaching, and we got our theology ducks in a row, but in the way that we live our lives, individually and together. We, we want our life as a church to hold up the good news about Jesus, like a pillar, right? And, and to support it like a buttress, to use Paul's language from chapter 3. We, we want to make a big deal about Jesus, and we want to validate the big deal about Jesus. And, and in order to do that, we and every healthy church, as the Bible judges health, we've got to answer a relatively simple question that's hard to get right. How are we going to treat the poor? I don't know that I need to belabor this, but the Bible shows that God is massively interested in helping people who cannot take care of themselves. It's a big deal to Him. And it would take a lot of sermons to show us everything God says about His heart for the poor. It would take lots of sermons to show us the nuances about how we should care for the poor, even the poor who don't follow Jesus. That's not what this passage is about, though, is it? As a reminder, our church loves expository preaching, which is just a fancy way to say we love preaching where the main part of this part of the Bible is the main point of of this sermon. So the big idea about this sermon really needs to be the big point of what we just read, says. And it isn't in this passage talking about those who are poor but aren't yet Christians. So that's not what the sermon's about today. It's not even mainly talking about poor Christians around the world who are part of other churches. What what is this passage about? So what's the sermon going to be about? One sentence, really simple. Healthy churches provide financial support for vulnerable members. Healthy churches don't just see those who have needs. They don't, they're not just aware of people who are in a really tight spot. They provide love and energy 
and time and relationship. And when it comes down to it, we provide financial support for vulnerable members. That's, that's what Paul is showing us here in this passage. He's making a big deal about it to Timothy. So let's dive in. What's the first thing we need to see toward that big idea? It's, it's really this, talking at a 30,000 foot view here. Healthy churches know which members need financial support. Let's not assume that or overlook that. Paul, remember just a couple paragraphs ago in chapter 4, Paul told Timothy to put certain things in front of the church. Chapter 4, verse 6. And if he does that, and if he proves by his life that he really practices what he preaches, if he does that, Paul says in verse 6 of chapter 4, then he will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. And for the rest of this letter, starting in chapter 5 all the way to the end, for the rest of the letter, Paul is going to be giving specific instructions on how Timothy is to oversee and shepherd certain kinds of people in the church. This song came up this morning during music practice, but uh, the church is really like that U2 song. Uh, We're one, but we're not the same. We get to carry each other. Y'all don't have to like you too, but that makes me break, that breaks my little pastor heart a little bit. We're one, but we're not the same. We get to carry each other. That's what the church is, and that's what Bono sings about. Uh, it, starting in verse 1 of chapter 5, we see that we are one, but we're not the same. And, and, and therefore, never showing partiality or favoritism, the church still recognizes the nuances about individual people in how we love each other. So look at verses 1 and 2. Even though all Christians are united and they're loved by God equally, That does not mean that we should ignore details about who they are when we consider how to love them and how to interact with them. The age of a person in the church is relevant to us. It helps us know how God wants us to love them. Specifically, Paul, like Charlton mentioned earlier, Paul uses family language. Love older members of the church like they're your parents. And love younger members of the church like they're your siblings. Y'all, we we learned this before in in the New Testament. We love Christians like family because that's what they are. The New Testament, inspired by God, never says to love someone as a or like a, but they're not really a. Love older people. Christians in the faith because they are your spiritual mom and dad, your your little siblings who are younger than you. We are not like the family of God, y'all. We are the family of God gathered in this congregation. And so we love each other and we respect each other. We even correct each other if need be in light of that. But look at verse 3. Maybe you picked up on this. Starting in verse 3, Paul gives the longest and the most detailed set of instructions in the whole letter. If you kind of break up this letter into chunks based on topics, this is the longest one in the letter. It's, it's, not, it's not dedicated to how to run a great children's ministry or how to choose good music for Sunday services. It's not even about how to do the work of evangelism or attracting certain kinds of people to Jesus. All those things matter. They're not ir- irrelevant at all. But if we were to measure importance of something by sheer word count, then in Paul's mind, one of the most important issues for Timothy as he pastors the church in Ephesus is this. How do you take care of widows? Remember this, that in in the ancient world and in tons of places around the world today, being a widow especially once a woman reaches a certain age, is a prison sentence. Because when your husband dies, you experience grief, both because you just lost your husband, and because without him, and without any real way for a woman in this culture to go and get a job outside the house, you have grief because his death means you are condemned to crushing poverty. I mean, subsistence living at best, like food stamps and then still needing help. That's what it meant when your husband died. And so in that culture, and in every culture, 
Christians honor widows. That's Paul's word in verse 3, but I bet you probably pick up pretty quickly. He ain't just talking about saying nice words about them from up front. We honor widows, well, like Paul is subtly saying here, we honor them by financially supporting them, by helping people who cannot help themselves. And so we can and we should take the principles of this passage and apply them to more than just widows. Do you see, it's not just that very specific set of circumstances that matters to Paul. It's those as we zoom out and we see, okay, well, our church doesn't really have many people in that circumstance. What do we do about that? Paul is, is helping us see how does the church of Jesus take care of people who can't take care of themselves, who are financially vulnerable. And from that 30,000-foot view, the answer starts with this. We help those who are financially vulnerable by knowing each other well enough to know who's in a situation where they need financial support. Blow our minds when I say this. American culture today is very different from Roman culture 2,000 years ago. Right? Uh, one of the ways that we are different is this. Without anybody ever telling us to think like this, I, I would bet most or all of us in this room even people outside of the church in everywhere in Effingham today, we all assume that we should, if we're good people, stay out of other people's business. Right? So what, what we do um, at work, as long as it's got nothing to do with you, but especially at home, in the bedroom, for recreation or for fun, that really is not any of your business. And it's very rude for you to assume otherwise. That's how, we ass that's how most of us think about life. But y'all remember, the, the Bible is written to the world. It's relevant to every culture. It transcends culture. And one way it's relevant to us is simply this. When you and I started following Jesus by trusting in him and loving him, we gave up our expectations of being totally independent from other people. That's what it means to be a Christian and follow him. Being a Christian signs you up to know other people well and to be known by them. To know their business and they know mine. To make yourself open to that kind of situation. If, if I were to give a one-sentence application to the whole church based on this, it, it would be really simply this. Join a community group. And go all in on one. Don't just show up to a meeting, but engage with a group text to know how we can be praying for each other. If, if you need help with child care, ask your community group. If something is terribly broken and dark and scary and sad in your life, tell them. Even if you don't even know what to ask them to do, tell them. That was a very long sentence, one sentence sermon. But, but specifically, remember this, this is being written to an elder, to a pastor of his church, and God gives a solemn charge, we can see here, to elders, to use God's words, oversee my people. To, to use Peter's words, Jesus' words to Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Not, not just anybody should have that role, right? We, we saw back in chapter 3 that God cares very much what kind of person becomes an elder or a pastor uh, and certain kinds of people should not be elders or pastors, in part because, as we see in chapter 5, elders and pastors have access to people's hearts. At least we should. That's precious cargo. That's sensitive information that not just everybody should have their paws on. And what's fascinating about Paul's words here is that elders have to oversee the church in a a twofold way. The first part is this Timothy and all pastor elders like him have to know their flock. Elders and pastors, our knowledge has to be personal. Our relationships with the people of the church has got to be up to date. And so, as much as it depends on us and our, our schedules and our other obligations in life, elders cannot be a people who act like a board of directors for a large organization. 
We make decisions that affect people, but I don't really know them. If they don't like it, well, they're just peasants, and they can shut up or ship out. No, no. We, we, we recognize that's not just messed up because that would mean they're jerks, but also because the, we can't be overseen and shepherded quite like that. I mean, we, and I'm specifically talking to me and to Billy and to Mark as elders, we need to know who's financially struggling, even if they, over time, refuse to come and share that with us out of shame or, or fear. And so, me, Billy, and Mark as elders, and, and all of One Savior listening in here, let's be a, a church of people who have trustworthy leaders. Let's be a church of people that expect our elders to know us. Let, let's be open to that. Let's even proactively pursue that. Let's, let's be people who come to our elders and say, I need you to pray for me. I, I need some advice or some counsel on something. I need to know what the Bible says about my life. Let's pursue that because without it, we will never even know who needs financial help. We won't. And we will therefore fail this passage. And therefore, we will fail to be a healthy church that holds Jesus up high. But y'all, I mean... I don't think it's a surprise to anyone to say this, this, these words of Paul do not stay at the 30,000 foot level, do they? Like what jumps out to most of us as we read this passage is how nitty gritty it gets, right? How detailed it is. It zooms in to the details of loving and overseeing the life of the church. And it turns out, for reasons that Paul explains, that being financially vulnerable in and of itself does not lead to a healthy church treating everybody the same way. Having, having financial needs does not necessarily mean the church supports them. What does the Bible say here? Well, secondly, healthy churches don't provide financial support for members who don't truly need it. Did you, did you note that as we were reading that Paul gives some pretty clear-cut instructions? I mean, it starts in verse 3, honor widows who are truly widows. As he goes on, it's clear it's, he's not just talking about those whose spouse has died and whose husband can't provide for them. Paul wants Timothy to understand exactly what kind of person in what kind of situation should qualify as a church member to receive financial support. Like, in that sense, who's truly vulnerable? Verses 4 and 16 say, if they have family, blood family who are able and willing to support them then they don't need to turn to the church if at all possible people who are financially needy should look to the family that they have in order to support them but what if they can't look to the family they have well paul says something that's maybe shocking to us he floats this out there they should look to the family that they could have if they got married again Widows, this is verse 11 and verse 14, widows, if at all possible, should try to remarry and even have kids, if that's possible, who then could provide financial support and financial security for them in the future. Let's take another culture break here because this is bizarro for us today. Remember how incredibly new the idea is that you only marry someone because you love them. It's not like romance has never been part of the picture. The Song of Songs is a, a wonderful part of the Bible that talks about the beauty of romantic love between a man and a husband. So the Bible's not painting a romanceless free marriage picture. No, 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 no. But let's be honest too, Christians and non-Christians for most of history and in most parts of the world today even have seen marriage as a, as a place to experience romantic love, but other factors have been at least as important as, do I think her face is pretty? So, in that culture, with those assumptions in place, it makes perfect sense for Paul to say, if you are financially vulnerable, and the family you have can't help you or won't help you, try making a new family. Go that route first. And Specifically, Timothy, verse 7, command them to try that route first. That is really foreign to us, isn't it? That is not how we think about 
our lives or marriage or poverty. So how, how in the world do we apply that today? Like, it, is Timothy and our elders today supposed to be matchmakers? That we help widows or even we could say single parents? Like, is, is part of our ministry to help people in this situation find new spouses? Again, let's expand it even more beyond being a widow. Should elders be savvy enough to help needy members get government assistance? Should we know the ins and outs of the welfare system? Or, or at least should we know how to connect people with those programs? And I think the answer is, it wouldn't be a bad idea. But I think there's at least two more pressing applications for one savior. How do we apply this to us? First, remember how I said in the last point that Paul's words are fascinating in that they call elders to oversee the church in a twofold way, right? Here's what I meant. On the one hand, being a pastor slash elder slash overseer, remember it's three words for one job, being a, an elder is highly relational. So in order to fulfill the role that we've been given by God, we have to know the members of the church personally and in detail, but at the same time, this passage is showing us that being an elder, it's not just for therapists, it's for engineers too. It, it's not just pure relationship work, it's also highly systematic, structured, planned. What, what I mean is that the Bible gives the church systems and processes like here that show us how our work is to be done as Christians. So relationships with church members should be um, grassroots and out of genuine love and affection. Um, I'll use the word organic. They should spring up out of that genuine concern for the members of the church. And also, at the same time, relationships with church members should in some way be structured and organized, again, because we love people. I, I, I am Mr. like, let me sit on the couch and talk to you for three hours kind of guy. That's just how I'm wired. I recognize that's not how God's wired everybody. And I, it's very important that we communicate, first off, that you don't have to be exactly like your pastor to be a faithful Christian. That's a danger every Christian has to face. But we also have to recognize that all of us, our strengths are our weaknesses, my, let's talk about your life over coffee for two hours personality, does not solve all the problems of the world. If everyone in the church were just like me, we would fail the poor very badly. And elders are challenged here. Don't just be Mr. Relationship. Be Mr. Thoughtfulness and care. Think through the details. A, a church's life to use a really common illustration, but a church's life is like growing a grapevine. We're in the South, so musky bags. Uh, the bottom line is, when, when, we're, when we're trying to figure out how healthy the grapevine is, what we really want to know is, how many grapes am I going to get, right? That's what we're growing it for. But in order f to grow healthy vines that grow a lot of grapes, the vine, I can say from personal experience, has to be controlled. The, the vine needs to be pruned, not necessarily because it's too big, but because thoughtful pruning makes the plant grow in the direction you want it to grow, and not in that way. The plant has to be supported by a trellis, because you all know so many plants, if you don't give it a trellis to climb, it stays real small. But you give it something to climb up, it'll get 20, 50, 100 feet long. It won't get very big, let alone bear much fruit without a trellis. It's way more likely to develop diseases and die flat out. The, the, the point is, growth and health of a church require personal care. Someone's got to get out there with the clippers and do just the right thing. But it also requires structure and systems. And so, brother elders and people of the church, as we consider pastoral ministry in our congregation and what it looks like, what we expect from elders and pastors, let's hear words from Scripture, from Proverbs 27. Know well the condition of your flocks. Give attention to your herds. New Testament, Acts 28, Acts 20, verse 28. Paul, speaking to a group of elders of the church he planted, 
pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Hebrews chapter 13, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. If we're a church of people whose elders and deacons work together to serve the poor, to organize our church and our ministry to the poor, we've got to learn from Paul's words here. So, brother elders, but also all of us as members, let's love each other well. Let's love the other members of one Savior enough to pursue them personally. And let's love each other well enough to pursue each other systematically. Because otherwise we will fail to care for the church, including those who need us the most. Widows, single parents, those who work as much as they can and still can't make ends meet. Those who have special needs. Our church and every healthy church has people who will fall through the cracks if the church as a whole does not love them well. It matters. Secondly, this passage also applies to one Savior in a very different but equally important way. Let me just, without naming names, let me say some things that we all know. In the last several years, multiple members of our church have been faced with the need to care for their aging parents. And of course, we do that out of love and, 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 and a joyful obligation. We care for our parents who need our help. But of course, it is very tiring work. And, and more than that, could you not imagine that on your worst days, it is deeply discouraging work, too. How, how does it feel to, to give up your whole life out of love, but to give up your whole life to take care of an older person, maybe even around the clock? How does it, how does it feel to be tethered to your house in order to serve someone, maybe even at their every beck and call? How does it feel to make that kind of sacrifice and often experience the person you're serving, the person who's vulnerable and has needs, what's it like to serve them and experience them in return being ungrateful or rude, unappreciative, forgetful, maybe even of who you are? What's it like to serve someone who is so overwhelmingly needy? Yes, we, we as a church should continue in prayer and beg Jesus to raise up deacons who can help visit these vulnerable folks. And if nothing else, to provide members caring for their family members with a break. To be a church of people who love our members well enough to know, you might need to just get out of the house, so let me do whatever I can to serve you better. Yes, we should do that. We should consider if the church needs to use some of the money that we share and we give together, we should consider if we need to budget regularly to meet bills for families who might not be able to afford them otherwise, despite their best efforts, despite working with their extended families. As a church, we should consider whether that should be a part of our annual budget. But if nothing else, brothers and sisters, Say it one more time because God seems to love saying it all the time. Let's love one another. Let's support people who are supporting others. Let's not leave them on their own. Let's not forget them in prayer or in friendship. Let's not just assume that being the primary caregiver for an elderly person or for a person with special needs or being a single parent with no spouse in the house to help you out, let's not love each other so little that we don't even ask how people are doing. That we, we don't even ask, how could I encourage you and help you in this difficult, difficult calling that God has 
called you to and that you do with love, but you're not perfect and neither am I. So, so let's be a buttress of the truth in the way that we live our lives and care for vulnerable folks. Let it, let it never be said by an outsider. I thought the church was supposed to be a family, but that is not how I see the people of One Savior living. Let's not, let's not invite people to blaspheme Jesus and to deny him because of the way that we don't love each other. Let's, let's be even better than that, friends. Let's, let's not provide financial support to people who don't truly need it, but let's provide every kind of support to the people who truly do. Lastly for today, we've talked a lot about our church, our church's response to the poor, our church's care for people who care for the poor and the needy. What about the needy members themselves? Is our obligation as a church to them simply to cut checks when asked for? Not at all. As, as nitty-gritty as Paul gets here, as into the weeds of the details as he gets, that's not what he's saying at all. Let's see one more thing for today, y'all. Healthy churches provide financial support to the vulnerable as well as a purpose. Did you notice that at the heart of Paul's words, he's describing what kind of person should qualify for the church's financial support? Having a need on its own is, is not sufficient for the church to get out of our shared funds. He's not just making sure that they truly don't have somewhere else to turn. He's investigating their character. Paul is saying, Timothy, you and the rest of the church in Ephesus probe people's hearts. Do you notice in verse 9 how Paul is really intent on guarding against the wrong kind of person being enrolled in the list of those who are supportive? Do you see why all that is? Why is it so important that we get this right? It's honestly simple. Members who seek and receive the church's financial support, especially long-term support, are obligating themselves to the gospel work of building up the church as a pillar and buttress of the truth. When, when someone is enrolled and enlisted in the church's care program, I think we do something that the world can only look at and want. Here's what I mean. Look at verse 5. If someone receives support as a true widow, what are they doing in verse 5? They're committing themselves to praying for the church's work night and day. You could call them the prayer staff of the church. And it's no wonder then in verse 10 that we see that it really matters what kind of person you have to be in order to receive long-term support. It's not asking, have you done enough good works to deserve our money? Not at all. Instead, Paul's system is trying to vet this, to answer this important question. In your life, do you have a track record of proving yourself faithful to your responsibilities? To your family, to your neighbors, to the church, it matters because we are going to be giving you a real purpose by enrolling you in the care program. And our mission that you're joining in is so important that we are going to rely on you to be faithful to it. So can we count on you? I, I don't know what kind of financial struggles you've personally had in your life or your family or your friends, but if you've ever known someone living in true, true poverty, especially long-term poverty? Have you, or have you ever seen the hopelessness that people experience? The uselessness that people feel? They're not able to help because either they're unable to work and they feel inadequate, or they're working so much just to try to make ends meet, but, and they've got no margin in life. Do you, do you, do you know the shame that comes from being financially vulnerable like that. 
We've seen people so ashamed that maybe our elderly friends and neighbors, they are ashamed because they are not able to do anything important anymore. Poverty goes hand in hand with depression for a reason. Because poverty and depression both lead people to say, because of who I am, what's the point? What's wrong with me? So, can we see how much it imitates Jesus to look a financially vulnerable person in the eyes and say, we need you to help. We will expect you to serve because without your service, we are going to suffer. We have an eternally important mission to make a big deal out of Jesus. And we love you and we are compassionate on your needs. We know that you can't work. You can't provide for yourself. We need you to provide help for the church through prayer. If you struggle to think prayer is a big deal, if you struggle to think prayer is work, go back to chapter 2 and see that Paul says it's the number one most important thing we do when we gather together. You who are serving as a church, we exist to spread a passion for the glory of Christ in Effingham and Savannah and beyond. And in every way that you can, but especially in prayer, we need you. And so, in taking our support, are you in? Are you in on this big adventure that Christ has called us to? Do you see now the, the betrayal of trust that comes when someone says yes to that in order to receive financial support and, and joins in the mission that goes along with it only to abandon it later? That's what Paul describes here. The, the, again, widows, but we would say anyone who needs financial assistance, they've abandoned their former faith, in verse 11, to get married again. Another opportunity arose, and they took it. Understandably, we would say, right? But they took that opportunity, and in doing so, abandoned their commitment, their, their pledge, their obligation to join in this mission so that they could get money somewhere else. They, they could take the money, Paul says, maybe a more dangerous situation is the person who takes the money, and they don't stop taking the money in order to get married or something else. They take the money, but then, what's his warning in, around verse 13? That they would waste their time by doing nothing but idly, lazily visiting people. Visiting people is not wrong. Friendship's not bad. But to, to receive the church's shared money and to then use it to basically loaf around. Even spreading gossip and, and meddling in other people's lives. You see what a betrayal that is of the obligation that the poor take when they receive the church's funds. It's no surprise then that some who receive and betray that kind of mission, if they betray that mission, why should we be surprised in verse 15 that in the end many betray Jesus? And stop following him. Brothers and sisters, let's give needy and vulnerable members the dignity of gospel work. The honor of having real purpose. Not busy work. Not something to make you feel important. But real ministry. And let's be wise enough to recognize the ways that our grace and our gifts toward the needy could be manipulated for selfish and evil purposes. But even recognizing that, let's love the poor anyway. Let's take care of our family anyway. In other words, let's love our vulnerable brothers and sisters like the Lord Jesus has loved us, knowing that some people would betray him, knowing that even the good ones would screw up big time and waste opportunities, knowing that self-sacrifice, the undeserved self-sacrifice of giving to those who won't ever be able to pay you back, but absorbing that cost anyway, and giving anyway, 
Because we trust, like Jesus, that God is pleased by our faith and by our love. You can call us stupid. You can call us naive. But let's be people who are optimistic enough to imagine what a God of love might do through our good works. Let's be, like Jesus says, innocent as doves and shrewd as serpents as we love each other. Brothers and sisters, that that kind of self-sacrifice, that sort of, from a human perspective, foolish throwing away of resources is exactly what we celebrate when we come to the table. Every single week, we recognize that a God who is too good for us loves us anyway and came for us and for our salvation because he loves people who cannot take care of themselves, who are poor and needy and in great vulnerability. This meal shows us that God helps those who can't help themselves. And we don't even want to until he comes to us first and changes our hearts and changes what our hearts long for. This meal celebrates what he has done for us and for everybody who believes. And so let me invite the musicians to come forward this morning. Let me invite you, brothers and sisters, to the table. If you are someone who believes the good news about who Jesus is and what he's done, and if believing the good news has changed your life and led you to follow his life and his teachings, if you've been baptized into Jesus and into his church, And if you're in good standing with your local church, then y'all, this table is for you. But if you haven't taken Jesus at his word yet, and you haven't changed the direction of your life to submit to him entirely, then our church, because we love Jesus, is honored to host you, to serve you, to befriend you. But Jesus himself says in his word that this table is not for you, not yet. Not until you trust in in him and repent of your sins to follow him. In the meantime, you are our honored guest. So please feel free to remain in your seat while the rest of us come to the table singing. When you come, take a piece of the bread and take one cup back to your seat so that we can celebrate the resurrected Jesus together. Y'all, let me invite you to stand and sing. And brothers and sisters, come to the table.